Sensor scan to one half parsec. On screen. Weapons are next. It's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, tiny whiny stuff. Open a channel. All vipers, break, break, break! Impossible to see the future. This is the emergency holographic doctor speaking. You wish the energy talking. Helmsman laid a new course. Watch how I saw. Now, it's gone completely. Engage. Hello and welcome to the Save Sci-Fi Podcast. Wow, I am incredibly loud. Whoops. Every week, every week I break the podcast. And it's because you're such a loud mouth, dude. That's what I do, I can't help it. So anyway, this week we are talking Star Trek Horizons and we have the captain himself with us, Paul Lang. I'm hoping I'm saying that right, because me and names are catastrophically horrible. Sometimes I can't even say Amy correctly and it's three letters. <laughs> no comment. No comment, dude. <laughs> we, we, we've got EJ with us, we've got Stuart, we've got Eugene... So we've got a full house for the first time in a while, and we have the aforementioned captain himself, uh, Paul Lang, who's, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, we watched Horizon this week. Star Trek Horizon fan film came out, and man was it a lot of fun to watch. I can't even begin to imagine how much fun that would have been to make. Well, it was a lot of fun. It was a blast. So, anyway, so anyway, let's get this thing rolling. Stuart, what do you think of Horizons? Um, I really actually enjoyed Horizons. Um, I grew up on the Star Trek, um, Star Wars side of things, so I've been slowly moving my way over into the Star Trek side of things over the past ten years. We, 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 we're converting him to the light side of the of sci-fi. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> oh, no, and, not that. It all honestly was really, all, it was really amazing with everything. Um, uh, set design, like the costumes looked awesome. Um, yeah. effects wise looked absolutely incredible. Oh yeah, that was spectacular. I watched it again this morning before the podcast, just so I could sort of. I've, it's probably the third time I've sat through the whole thing, and yeah, it's just as good the third time as it is the first. So. Well, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's really a testament to. Um, Tommy Kraft, who I hope one day you guys can get him on. I know he's pretty busy at the moment, present moment, um, but uh, that young man basically did everything from the directing to the sewing, the costume, the producing, special effects, music, and uh, he's going to be. Uh, I tell people he's going to be the next Josh Whedon. Yeah. You know, uh, he, oh, he might be the next JJ as much as he loves lens players. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, so uh, he is an up-and-coming, up-and-coming young man, um, 24, 25, maybe, maybe just 24, and, um, you know, this was his first feature, and just, it, I'm, we're really glad about the response that we're getting. Yeah. We'd like to get the word out, so thank you for having me today, by the way, just want to say that, and, um, you know, thanks for helping get the word out on Horizon. Yeah, that's, that's what we do, it, uh, the whole reason we started Save Sci-Fi all those years ago was to help spread the word on fan films, fan projects, and that sort of thing, because we love them as much as everyone else, so we, we try and support shows that are on the air, we try and support fan projects as much as possible, so yeah, thank you for making them, and um, yeah, we'll definitely continue to sort of keep an eye on them. For... Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's really, it's a good, what you guys are doing is great, you know, because you've got fans out there with obvious skill sets, and, you know, the ability to... Uh, you know, put out films that, even though it is a fan film, you know, I, I would hope that it, it ranks up there at least with, uh, at least with the stuff on the Sci-Fi Channel. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think they forget that's... the Sci-Fi Channel is meant to have Sci-Fi part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No comment. I shall refrain from any. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I, 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 I hereby vote to opt out of that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll the TV channel, though. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We've 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 had sort of a bit of a tough love relationship with sci-fi over the years. So on the plus side, they're heading back in the direction of sci-fi now with some 
really good series, so we, we definitely sort of appreciate that from them. But yeah, some of their movies can be a little bit... Why? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I'm more frustrated with Asylum than anything else. It's just like, <laughs> come on, guys. Not yeah. everything needs to be a crappy monster movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, Make a good yeah. monster movie at least, maybe. <laughs> it's okay. We've got Shark, Tornado, Octopus, Godzilla, Python. Right. I, I, did I, I, shoot me. Did shoot I miss me. one? <laughs> I'd, I'd rather just take the Space Worlds from Rebels. <laughs> 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 Uh, anyway, um, well, uh, Ian Searing, uh and then uh, the pop music singers. <laughs> yeah, Tiffany versus Britney and whatever, and that one, that one sci-fi was just the worst. Oh yeah, it was uh, the crocodile versus the big snake. Uh, you know, that's as much as I can remember of that <laughs> that wonderful show. Yeah, yeah, it sort of falls into the category of as soon as I saw they were making a movie called Transmorphers, I was like. Yeah, no, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, back a little bit closer to topic. Um, what was it like working as, uh, I'm, like, playing the role of the ship's captain and sort of taking on that, whoops, taking on that role? Well, I when I read the script, um, Tommy gave me a script right after he, he wrote it. And the character Harrison Hawk uh, fit me pretty well because I, I spent some time in the Marine Corps. Um, and unlike the typical Star Trek captain, you know, Star Trek's not, not about warfare. And, and that's something that Trekkies will, will tell you, you know, yeah. um, a lot. It's about exploration. But Roddenberry did create, you know, the whole um, Build up to the to the Romulan War. I mean, that is something that happened in in the Roddenberry universe, yeah. and so that that was in there. And so the character of Harrison Hawk is is a character that comes about because of the this military style conflict, and he is a military style officer versus you know an explorer, kind of like you yeah. know like the, the the Picards and the and the Shatners and so on. And so when I read it. You know, it, it it was it's a great script. When I read it, it was very ambitious. Um, you know, I was I had done films before that. I was an actor. You know, before Horizon, um, and you know, just the overall scope of the film seemed so hugely ambitious um, that I, I thought Tommy was a little crazy. You know, no budget, our, our feature length film, and tons of CG. So. I was a little nervous, to say the least, when uh, I signed on, thinking that this project would never come to fruition. But that feeling went away uh, right after I started spending some time with Tommy because his level of dedication is just amazing. But uh, yeah, working through, the, you know, portraying Captain Hawk um, was easy because the, the character's so well uh, written. I mean, so well developed in, in the script, meaning, you know, you had the backstory with his. His uh, his fiance that that got you know I, I don't want to spoiler alert <laughs> we got to put that out there if you haven't seen it go see it first oh, yeah. uh, you know but um, you know the story his backstory is is pretty prevalent there and um, it you know really led to uh, you know my experience in the military and and I could bring that on board so uh, it was a good character and then the rest of the the rest of the cast is is, is wonderful you know. Um, Mark Bowers, the, the first officer who plays um, Jackson, was uh, wonderful. You know, I, I, I'd worked with him in the past. And um, Ryan Weber, who played um, Francis Brooks, he, he is a huge Trekkie. Nobody, I, anybody who starts to talk about whether this is canon or that is canon, and believe me, those two, between Tommy and Ryan Weber, they know more about Star Trek, then, then I would put them up against anybody. Um, they, they Challenge definitely know. accepted. I was going to say, we should throw them up against <laughs> AJ and see what happens. <laughs> All right. Get, 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 get AJ, <laughs> get Samuel Cockings, get a couple others that I know, and we'll just have a big, massive panel and see what sort of quibbling happens. That should prove exponentially <laughs> I think, hilarious. I think they would totally take you on for that. So I think that's the next... If you can get them on, get those two, those two on and 
have a little uh, Star Trek, uh, you know, trivia, and you know they um, they'll love it. And also, one thing about the character too is is the Enterprise um, the Enterprise show itself. That that was a very um, how do I say it? It's, it's not. It wasn't so. The captains and the people in the Enterprise were a little bit more, I think, uh, realistic yeah. than some of the other series. Um, so that's one of the things um, that I feel like he picked me for the role. Uh, you know, he approached me for it is because I'm not. You know, obviously I'm very pretty, but I'm not a, uh, a typical <laughs> Hollywood type. You know, person. Yeah. So no, you, you definitely you definitely look like you fit the role. You definitely had that sort of air of commander about you, where everyone was sort of like showed that respect, and it was really well done by all of the cast to play that crew. Um, yeah, yeah, great cast. And I've worked with a lot of them. Um, Michigan is not a huge market. Um, I, I'm in California, um, but the, the Michigan crew. Uh, I'd work with most of those. Ashley Croft, who who played Marie Sutherland. We still don't know whether or not she's alive. Um, and then there was also uh, Janine who played Yaris. I'd worked with both of them in the past, so you know we, we're familiar with each other. Nice. That that, which, al which helps. that always helps. Yeah. Yes. So, say um, tomorrow they announce Star Trek Horizons Two, and they give you a chance to sort of send the story in any direction you want. What direction would you take it? Well, um, and it's actually, Horizon was the name of the planet, just so we know. The Discovery yeah. is the name of the ship. Um, well, there's a lot. We, we actually had, in our little production group, we had a little uh, poll, you know, on what, on what was next. And um, a couple of the things that were floated, uh, of course, the, the war itself, Sharon, you know, we, we mentioned that as the Romulans amassed their fleet there and the Battle of Sharon was was something that they wanted to go, you know, that, that was floated. But, um, I, you know, I think the, the proper sequel to this would uh, be a little bit more uh, humorous. I think we need a little bit more of that Star Trek humor uh, that, you, that you see in a lot of the, a lot of the yeah. uh, series. And also um, something that, you know, the, the key story that Tommy tried to get across is that, uh, you know, we continue to do the same thing over and over again. History repeats itself. Federations come or alliances come and alliances go and and how we need to keep really, you know, focused on trying to bring people together for peace. And, and a story that continues that, I think, would be uh, a lot of fun. And yeah. to build on, you know, the whole working with a Romulan, you know, spoiler alert, and, uh, <laughs> but we don't really get to see what the Romulans look like, just so we know. Yeah, no one saw a Romulan in this movie, so. Yeah. And which I thought was actually really well done, because I know from the original series, when Kirk runs into the Romulan ship there, he explicitly says, during the Romulan War, we never saw their faces, we only ever heard their voices. Which right. Is... Balance of Terror was the episode. Uh, yeah. Um, that's right. still one of my favourite Trek episodes, where it's sort of Kirk versus effectively a... It's almost like a battleship versus a submarine. And that, right. that story is definitely one of my favorites, and I'm sort of disappointed that the movies didn't, the the Abrams movies hadn't really had the the balls to do something like that. Um, well, you know, I, I think the Abrams movies are, you know, they're nothing against them. Obviously, they they're successful in the sense that they bring a lot of people into the movie theaters, yeah, and and hopefully bringing a whole new generation of young people, you know, to to kind of look at Star Trek and and maybe go back and take a look at the original series. And, well, that's effectively and, uh, what happened with me. I walked out of the first of the J.J. movies, and I thought to myself, well, the ships on Stargate could absolutely annihilate anything that I just saw. I'd better go watch and make watch the older stuff and sort of get caught up on what everyone's going on about. So, yeah, that's when I yeah. sat down and watched all the older stuff. I still haven't got to Deep Space Nine, which E.J. hates me for. Um, <laughs> but Nine okay. is the bomb. Oh, best oh. series ever. I'm getting there ever. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I've seen all of the others. I just haven't got to Deep Space Nine yet. <laughs> well, you want to know? Neither have I. Uh, just <laughs> to put that out there. I, uh, I am definitely, um, you know, the original series, and then, you know, of course, Next Generation, and then um, I had kids. 
So that pretty much <laughs> uh, killed TV. I thought you were going to say Voyager and then just stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just stop before Voyager. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I had kids. That threw me for a loop. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it was SpongeBob after that, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I could say it could be worse. Man. But, but uh, one thing the Abrams movies lack, which I think, you know, it comes out in the comments and you can see it, is is the, you know, just the, the interpersonal conflicts. You know, the, the conflicts in the... JJ's universe is so extra personal, you know what I mean? There's no internal yeah. battles or moments of, of you know, uh, introspection or whatever I'm trying to, you know, yeah. the words I'm trying it's, to it's, it's, it's effectively, it's so they sold their soul to get 100 million views is effectively what the JJ yeah. Abrams movies I've heard are described as. It's yeah. Well, right, but, you know, they do bring in millions of dollars and they are successful and, um, you know, ideally they bring in new people into the, the Star Trek universe. So now it's just a matter of trying to, you know, tr trying to mix that together, you know, trying to yeah. bring, and that's what I think Tommy, because Tommy actually does in the movie, there are some references to the J.J. universe, uh, obviously, you know. With, the um, destruction of know, Romulan, Romulus. Sorry. Yeah. Her. Yeah, and so, um, so yeah, he, uh, he, he, and he, and Tommy loves J.J. Abrams. You know, he does. Yeah. Um, huge. His his favorite series is definitely the Enterprise. Uh, he'll he'll tell you all about that. And um, but I think that he's trying to bring all of those aspects together. You know, uh, he, he some of the concepts are obviously from the original series. Uh, some of the con uh, concepts are also from uh, Next Gen. And then he brings JJ's universe into that too. So, yeah. he, he, I think he did. And then, of course, Enterprise. He, and he tried to wrap up a lot of the um, open-ended story arcs that, that Enterprise, when it, the series ended, they left open. You know, yeah. the Phantom well, God. Oh yeah, they, he, he did a really Temple. good job of bringing all that together. Because I'm far from an expert yeah. in Star Trek. I, I'm more of a Stargate person, but that's beside the point. Um, and but I still picked up on a lot of those references, like the reference to the destruction of Romulus to the to that ancient race, which I'm pretty sure is from Deep Space Nine, that built those platforms. I actually Googled them. Uh, er, early, early TNG. Early TNG? Um, early yeah. TNG, like, it's, it's, yeah, second, yeah, the Iconians? Second. Yeah. yeah they, the Iconians the, the, was... The, um, yeah, the, the race that built the platforms, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just sort of the different sort of groups. And, yeah, it, he did a really good job bringing that all together. One of the few things I'm sort of surprised um, I, you, that was sort of shied away from, I understand why it was shied away from. In the TV series, they're talking about upgrading the NX-01 class, the actual hull, to make it... There was, they had an extra addition to the main sort of hull that made it look closer to the original series Enterprise. And they're looking at doing that for the next season. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of surprised that that was shied away from a bit. But at the same time, I can understand why you wanted that familiar look to the fans of Enterprise, and having this extra thing on it wouldn't look as familiar. So, well, you're talking about the uh, Doug Drexler retrofit, yeah, uh, of the NX04. That yeah. Was talking about. yeah. I, apparently, and yeah, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that actually didn't happen yet um, in the timeline that Tommy is ah. is at. So. Yeah, so the so the retrofit happened, I think, after the Romulan War, or, or right before it, but it didn't happen yet in the time frame that Horizon is in. Ah. So, because that's, that's been brought up. Obviously, when you put something out there, the amount of um, dissection by the Trek universe is huge. And oh, yeah. so, they have... Uh, they are, you know, of course, the Iconians were supposed to have four eyes, but we just didn't have that big of a budget, so they have two. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, you can you can definitely see how, you know, I mean, it, the fans are the protectors of the canon. And, um, you know, it, you really have to, especially in the Trek universe, you have to make sure you stick to, you know, what is, you know, canon, or else you'll get eviscerated oh yeah shoot up so yeah. um on a slightly different note um i'm not sure exactly how much you know about what's happening with axina but after they were shut down are you guys concerned that something like that could happen to you 
in the future if you try and continue doing another one? No. Um, I, you know, you look at, um, I know uh, Star Trek continues as a Kickstarter going on right now, um, and I hope that they're successful. I also know Renegades is on their second one, too. Yeah. I, I um, you know, once again, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I know I've talked with Alec Peters. They, they seem like they're good people. I think that they went about it with a business model that just um, was not, you know, kosher with, with CBS. Yeah. I think it has more to do with the business model rather than it does to do with the content. Nah. No. No, well, obviously. Also- What's that? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I was just, I, I talk with, with Alec on occasion as well, but like you said, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I also think it has something to do with the fact that with the amount of money they were able to raise and were continuing to raise, they were getting on the verge of being able to compete quality wise with some of, uh, um, at least maybe not on, the, obviously not on the same level as like a $200 million motion picture, but they were yeah. getting. Uh, High enough uh, quality, wi- quality with the money they were able to, to raise that CBS and Paramount started to view them as a threat and could actually be pulling viewers away from well, from that stuff. You know, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, once again, it could be. You're absolutely right. It could be. Um, you know, CBS and Paramount. You know, it's their it's their playground. You know, it's their toys. Yeah. Uh, it's their intellectual property. So, you know, they can determine how, how it gets used, you know, and who uses it and so on and so forth. I don't think that making, um, and, and even in their minds, you know, there's been a lot of Trek films over the years. And I don't think that, you know, uh, making fan films hurts them in any way, you know, because more and more people, you know, can you know, keep up to date, and, you know, get their Trek fix that way. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, the money is an issue in, in such a way that, you know, it, it was getting large, but, you know, a million two with making a movie is still low budget, you know, uh, matter of fact, I think it's still ultra low budget in terms of like the way that, you know, Hollywood yeah. plays the movie. And so, cause I've been in, you know, many movies that were, you know, I think the budget is were ten to twenty million, and they're still considered low budget. You know, so yeah. I think ten million actually is the is the low budget mark. Five to ten is, low, you know, is considered yeah, low budget. I'm, under five I'm looking it up on on C, uh, on SAG's website to see what they yeah. Because I get paid differently if the movie doesn't have a big budget. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Um, well, and, that, and and whether it's new media or not new media and all that. And I mean, yeah, I agree with you percent. You know that that it's it's CBS and Paramount's playground and fan films don't don't harm anything. I just I, and I agree with you what you were saying about the business model, but I think in addition to the business model that they're approaching it with, you also had the amount of money they're raising combined with the the production value they were getting, and I think it just got too far on for that for CBS and Paramount to be comfortable with it. Yeah, and, and on a side note, though, you know, it just shows you that do you necessarily and, and I, you know, I understand that, you know, um, their production value was high, but, you know, here you have a young man, you know, Tommy with less than $50,000, you know, because he did spend some of his own money and he has a feature film that has really good production value, especially in the CG area. You know, yeah, the, the uniform collars might've been a little big because we were sharing uniforms and, um, you know, uh, but still, you can see what a fan can do, you know, a dedicated fan can do exactly. you know, with, with not a lot of money, you know, cause oh, yeah. I can just imagine what Tommy could do with a half a million dollars, you know, which I hope he finds out. I, I, I'm sure we're going to find out, yeah. you know, and I think the passion and the, and the skill level uh, that he brought up, it really is going to set the bar for, for fan films, um, you know, for in the future. Oh yeah, it, it definitely oh, yeah. set the bar high for, for for fan films. Yeah, that was the one thing that really really pulled me into into Horizon was the production value you guys were able to get. And while obviously it wasn't you know a million dollar, ten million dollar motion picture, uh, having worked with budgets similar to to, to what you were mentioning uh, on some of my own projects, 
you know, the fact that he was able to get to that to that level uh, of, of production value re- really does say a lot to to his skill and and the team he put together. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, he, you know, when you think about you know CG prices for feature films, um, you know, they're going to, you know, they are ten thousand dollars a minute for CG, and um, you know, he, that's this film's almost all CG and it's almost all green screen. So there's yeah. only, I think, um, there's one, two, uh, you know, sets that we were on that were, you know, like there was the, the, the scene in the home, you know, near the beginning of the uh, film, and then the forest scene um, were, were just, were actually on set. So, you know, um, yeah. the rest of them were all green screen. Well, c- sort of cross-comparing you guys to, say, Battlestar Galactica, Blood and Chrome, the web series... Um, I would have to say that overall, I think your guys' one was way better, and theirs one that was an actual official sort of production. And I think the visuals yeah. for you guys, and especially with the CG sets and stuff, look spectacular, even compared to theirs. So that is sort of such a credit to the work that was put into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why he doesn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to start telling myself that. But that's why I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta go ask to get a girlfriend. I think that's what every low budget producer tells themselves in the middle of the night while they're balled up into the corner, crying, <laughs> crying. You know. <laughs> you know, but yeah, don't, I, I keep telling him though he'll he'll meet one at the next uh, Comic Con or you know yeah. when the word gets out. So <laughs> yeah. here's the hoping. When, when when word gets out, they'll go. To, they'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, yeah, those are the ones you want. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know if I talk about Paul's um, what, uh, stuff he's been in and stuff he's coming in, because there's yeah, go for something it. very interesting I've no- I have have seen that Paul is going to be in co- in a certain movie that's coming out in two weeks' time. <laughs> yeah, that's the that- premiere is actually the day before we do a big screen for Horizon is the Detroit premiere for uh, Batman vs. Superman. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Paul is uh, is actually a protester in Batman for the Superman, so we'll have to try and spot him. That's yeah. going to be well, actually, fun. Actually, I have a scene. I have lines. So, oh. Yeah, so I have a role. Um, you can hear me in the first trailer uh, for that movie. You can hear me yelling in the background, it's our planet, you know, he's out of control. And um, so I have a, I have a scene, I, you know, uh, it's, it's obviously a scene where I'm, you know, a little bit angry. And um, a little. You know, <laughs> Henry C- Caval is in the scene. I'm angry that all of the good roles are taken by British people. And, uh, <laughs> Hang on, that, uh, that or, or is British or Australians? Is Henry Australian? What is he? I think he's British, isn't he? He's British, yeah. Yeah, he's British. Yeah. So the British and the Bat Australians. Batfleck's not British, though. Are... Well, what's that? Batfleck isn't British. Yeah, no, but... after. Not British, no. no, no. He's, uh, he's sort of disowned by Americans, though. So he's, <laughs> he's from Boston. Yeah. No. Uh, no. Ben's Ben. From what I've seen, Ben Affleck will be a great Batman. Um, and from what I've seen of the movie, it's it's you know I haven't I haven't seen you know I've seen pretty much almost all that you guys have seen. I just have some insight into some you know some of the stuff they filmed in Detroit. So that was when I was in Detroit. Uh, they filmed that movie there. And, uh, you know, I got a, I got a roll and then during the shoot, actually my voice went out. So they were filming, uh, and it was my turn for my role to come up. And I had no voice at that point because we were protesting. And so I had to just, you know, basically man up and try to get the words out. I felt like my esophagus was bleeding and, um, I guess the effect worked because it made my voice that much less annoying and I was just <laughs> screaming and, uh, you know, and I wasn't sure it was going to be in the movie. Um, I, I wasn't sure until I heard the first uh, trailer and it was, it's tough to hear me, but when you listen to the first trailer, you will hear me in the background and uh, it took a while for me to figure that out and then um, after that I felt a lot better about my chances of being in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh, going back uh, in the conversation just a little bit, I looked it up on SAG's website, and low budget is currently two and a half million and below. 
according to Sarah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so just back so up. he's super low budget. He's non existent budget, you know, this movie for Horizon. And, and yes. I mean, if you think about it, his budget's about the same as short, a short film budget, according to SAG. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, he, you know, he's already gotten some, uh, he's been noticed. You know, Doug Drexler, uh, who is, you know, a, a, a wicked good, you know, special effects guy in his own right, um, he, he's, he's noticed Tommy. And if you get his stamp of approval on Horizon, you know, I mean, it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and, uh, and, and uh, I, know, I know Doug, and he's, uh, I mean, he's won Emmys and, and all this kind of crazy stuff. So. Oscar. I think he won an Oscar. Uh, his Oscar was for makeup, not for VFX. Makeup. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was on uh, makeup on First Contact, I believe. But he won his Emmys in VFX uh, for VFX on Battlestar Galactica, which is pretty. You know, so the fact that he's noticing him is pretty awesome. Yeah, and he he reached out to Tommy a couple times, and so you oh, know nice. that's and that's kind of that's what Horizon is in 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 a sense is Tommy's master thesis. You know, it it's uh, <laughs> how many people out there can say, hey, here's my film. You know, here's a film. You know, I made a film. And not only did you make a film, but you made a, a complete film, you know. The film's got all the aspects of it, you know, from, you know, uh, there's no scrimping, the sound, the effects. We, we did have help. We had great help from, um, you know, some of the sound mixers. Michael Huang, who's in L.A., uh, man, he, he really, really came through in the end with the, with the sound. Um, you know, there are a lot of people. Tommy's brother helped with the set. You know, there are some people who help with modeling. You know, so there there are some people who really did did help out. Lisa Hansel, who is in L.A., um, makeup artist, did the makeup on both the Vulcan uh, Ambassador and also the Romulan Admiral, and she is quite well known. And she did a she did a bang up job. Of course, our makeup was done by Vera Kazoos, who is a Detroit local, and she's she's wonderful. We love her to death. Uh, it's it's funny you mentioned Lisa. She she worked on on um, my project Nobility as well. Yeah, so you know her. She's she's really good. Oh yeah, and she lent her time. Her, yeah. And I, you know, I mean, this is a true fan. You know, when you think of fan films, this really is a true fan film because it's passion project. Um, no one got paid. You know, um, which you know irritates me to no end. No, only kidding. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know. <laughs> we did it for the we did it you know for the love of it and um, really because you know Tommy when I saw his work on some of his other short films I was in you know you, you know that he was gonna do it get it done and now I'm the captain of a starship not many people can say that <laughs> <laughs> jealous <laughs> yeah just don't get it don't let him get you out of the chair you know <laughs> Uh, yeah, because um, while you're there, you can make a difference. <laughs> so, I, was waiting, I was waiting for Stuart. I thought Stuart might have had more things to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I wasn't sure. I was waiting for you guys because you guys seem to be t um, taking the reins on this one. <laughs> and I um, heard a lot of Jenkins references in there. <laughs> Yeah, I picked up a few references. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to think. I'm just trying to think. You pretty much covered everything I had, actually, like question wise. Mm. So, um, probably the only thing is if you do another one, please invite us along. <laughs> oh, of course. Come on out. Hopefully, <laughs> the next one will be done in Cal California um, and not so much green screen. I. I will say this about from an actor standpoint, doing a film like this, uh, a green screen film, not that easy um, because you don't have I mean, acting, you know, when you have a scene and you're interacting with other people, it's nice to have the other people there. Yeah. So a lot of the scenes that you see um, where, you know, we're all at the table in the conference rooms or even all on the ship. 90% of the time, it was one person in the room, and we were reacting to what was supposed to be happening. Um, so it's a testimony to the actors involved, you know, that they could pull it off, because 
trying to react to something that's not there is difficult. Oh, yeah. um, some of the most powerful scenes were the ones that where we had each other to play off of. And that's important for an actor, um, you know, yeah. to do it. It's also a testament to Tommy CG because, you know, when you see an explosion going off and it looks like I'm rocking in reaction to this explosion, well, obviously all I'm doing is throwing myself to the side and the explosion is not there. Uh, so, you know, to burst everybody's bubble. And so he really, he really, you know, had to react to us, yeah. you know, which, which is a testimony to him. But the actors, you know, for the most part, did great. Um, they really did. They did a they did a great job, and you can see it in the reactions of the fans. You know, of course, there's always those YouTubers that have nothing else to do but complain, or you know, uh, you know they, you know, say something bad because for whatever reason they feel like they need to. And um, you know, but for the most part, the reception of the film has been wonderful. And uh, you know, we're just on a mission to make sure that everyone gets a chance to see it. You know, it doesn't cost nothing but an hour and a half. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely, definitely worth watching. Um, especially if you love the Enterprise era stuff. So, just on a random note, have you by any chance seen the video floating around on Facebook? I think it's a GIF. Where somebody stabilized a shot of the next-gen cast when they're being attacked by something and you just see everyone <laughs> bouncing around. You can see them holding onto their chair and shaking because instead of the camera... Shaking, they've stabilized it so it sits locked, and right. it looks absolutely hilarious. And that's basically what it's happened. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, if you there, the blooper reel for Horizon is up. So if you get a chance to check out the blooper reel, you can see some of that, and um, you know, you can see that you know it's it's uh, what we what we had to deal with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely have to check that out after this. Um, yeah, and there's also a change.org. Uh, it's not really serious, but we stuck. Uh, we started a change.org to get Tommy to make a sequel. So <laughs> it's somewhere out there. Change.org, like make a sequel, Tommy Craft, uh, something to that effect. You can find it on, uh, I don't even know where, maybe still Facebook. Do the thing. <laughs> what, get the gag reel or get the, uh, get the change org? Both. Sorry, I got the gag reel up. <laughs> 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 that doesn't surprise me. Just watching it now. <laughs> uh, that's, I think that's like one of the best parts of our movies is the is the gag reels because there's so much funniness that happens on sets. Yeah. Oh yeah, and it makes you feel like you want to go back and do it again. Yeah. E even though you know, I mean, it was uh, it was long and it was you know arduous at times and cold because it's in Michigan. So you know, there was a couple shots shoots that had to be canceled because uh, the snow. Uh, Tommy got in a car accident um, coming back from Detroit after a shoot. Um, you know, a lot of snow. Uh, so, you know, beyond that, you know, we, we, you know, if you think of it that way, we won't want to do it again. But you see the gag reel and you're like, man, we had a good time. Well, you know, if you do happen to do a <laughs> sequel, I hereby nominate EJ to be in command of the NX-05 under <laughs> one condition. Uh-oh. He crashes it into a planet. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he's saying no that. And, and, and the reason he crashes it into a planet is because he's not paying enough attention. He's distracted <laughs> by something, and he turns around and goes, "Oh, that planet's getting close." Well, crap. <laughs> he's texting, Oops. sitting there on his phone <laughs> as he goes dreaming into a planet. So, 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 Discovery, we need to help. Use your tractor. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so, so, okay, the enemy's on the other side of this planet. I've got a plan, but you're not going to like it. What? We've got to use photon torpedoes to tunnel us a hole through. Um, I oh. don't think that's going to work. Do what I say, damn it! <laughs> Stay yeah, on target. You see Stay you on target. Laugh at that comment, just, just so you know, when you see nobility. You're really going to laugh. Just remember, at it's that. photonic. Photonic torpedoes. <sighs> that we, uh, we got corrected a couple times on that one. Oh, oh, uh, we'll, we'll start. What's that? Well, I'll, I'll start heading towards the planet, and then I'll be like, "Oh, that's right. Phase Cloak was was season five of TNG." Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Don't need a Deadpool <laughs> break the fourth wall in Star Trek. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so now we go through the planet. Uh, uh, but yeah, why photonic torpedoes, and, uh, and and what's the difference? 
I think it's just said uh, that they... I don't know. I think but it's, apparently it's photonic. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's, it's photonic torpedoes for Star Trek, photon torpedoes for Star Wars, and I think the reason they're photonic torpedoes in Star Trek is to stop the Star Wars fanboys crying. No, no, no. It's Thanks. photon torpedoes in Star Wars. It is? Yeah, it is. It's proton. And photon okay. torpedoes in TOS, TNG, and, and up uh, until um, s- middle of DS9 where they switched to quantum torpedoes yeah. um, mm-hmm. because they were more powerful. But I think they also had photon torpedoes as well, and they switched back and forth. Uh, but I then I, th- I think it has something to do with just... I don't know if it's a name difference or there's actual tech difference, but uh, I think it's just... Pro- photon torpedoes from TOS haven't been created yet. Yeah. Nah, oh, okay. Semantics. Yeah, I, I like the idea. Oh, sorry, Enterprises go. before the original series, and um, you know, someone corrected us that they weren't photon for torpedoes; they were photonic torpedoes. And then, of course, we introduced tricobalt torpedoes, which I believe didn't come about for a while either, um, as you know, in this in the series. The first time I remember hearing of them is see the uh, the pilot of Voyager where they had tricobalt uh devices yeah um and and they were supposed to be more powerful so i was a bit surprised to hear tricobalt set so early in the timeline but uh especially since they weren't really used that often yeah. but but they also gave a good explanation. You guys gave a good explanation as to why they wouldn't be used very often if they right. have these unpredictable, unstable effects. Yeah, yeah they definitely stop using them. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. 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 And it would explain why it wasn't a normal uh, part of their, of their armament thereafter. But then it also brings up the question, why were they part of Voyager's armament in the pilot? So. Well, think of it this way. Voyager is, what, 150, 200 years later, something like that. True, so you but could say season... in that period of time they could have been, they could have um, plot device the plot device to plot device and make the plot device work. Problem is, is that in season I think it's like six or seven of Voyager, they go back and explicitly say that that's not a normal part of a ship's arsenal. Yeah, right. And it's highly unusual, even in the in the late twenty fourth century. So. But this is just hang. I'm sorry? They never got the hang of those tricobar torpedoes. <laughs> and if you actually watch the uh, the blooper reel, that was the word that gave me the worst time during the whole shoot, which tricobar... <laughs> I still have a hard time saying it. Tricobar torpedoes. It just didn't come off the tongue easy. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'd be hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, we're heading up to about time when we start doing the the news and the model reports. So, overall, guys, out of 10, what would you rate Horizons? I would give it a solid 8. Um, and most of the reason it doesn't get a solid 10 is just because of the budget limitations, which is 110% out of their control. So, yeah, definitely sort of solid 8, 8.5. Uh, I'm giving it a nine. Nine? Yep. Uh, I was. Re- I think it was one of, if not the best, uh, fan film I've seen for Star Trek ever. So, I really, really enjoyed it. I'll definitely agree with that. I I would also give it a, a solid nine because, agreed, the budget budget they had no control over, but uh, the way they tied so many aspects of Star Trek, they did a real good job with it. Yeah. Okay. You guys have sold me. I'll lift. I'll lift it to a nine. You guys have sold me on it. <laughs> uh, AJ, what do you think? Um, I'm actually. I think I'm going to keep it at an eight. Um, uh, I think. But from see, coming from me, that's actually pretty damn good. Yeah, considering uh, he I hasn't s- rated any other movie we've watched above a seven, giving you <laughs> guys an eight is really good. <laughs> Probably from uh, here. He can see me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, no. Uh, no. Uh, no, no, but seriously, I mean, eight, eight, eight to me sounds reasonable. You guys had a, had a, a solid story. Um, some of the minutiae I ha- and um, the, the way it was executed I had some issues with. But, no, you, see, you still had a solid story. Um, you had uh, characters that people cared about. You had, uh, obviously, um, great effects, especially considering the budget. Um 
you know, and, and so I think, especially compared to all the other fan films out there, uh, a solid a solid eight sounds good. Yeah. I don't know, Amy. Have, did you get around to watching it, or have you been too busy with uni? Too busy with uni at the moment. Ah. <laughs> I've got I've got about three months to finish my course. Yeah, uh, that's fine. It's understandable. So. Well, I appreciate that, guys. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I mean. Well, okay. Well, that only leaves your review. What would you give it out of ten? Uh, my own view? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know what? He's like, uh, I want to come back for the next one, so... Yeah. I, I would, you know, at least a solid three. No, only kidding. Um, you know, it, it, it just depends on what, what are, what is the, you know, what is the comparison here? So, you know, that's, that's the thing that I, I try to hope that people keep in mind. Is that you know you mentioned it with the budget constraints? You know this is not a this is not a you know uh, uh, produced by a studio in any way, shape, or form. And in that sense, I mean it's a ten out of ten because this is some kid in his basement. You know, for the most part. You know, but well, if I was to put it up against, you know, it, it's better than some of the actual budgeted films out there. Um, you know, and not as good as some of the others. So you know, even I would give it somewhere. You know. I would give it a nine. I would give it, you know, if I was, if I didn't understand the passion behind it and the, um, and the dedication of Tommy and all that, you know, if I was looking at it, you know, strictly, you know, just as a objective and, and comparing it to the feature films out there, it may not get up to a nine, but you know, you gotta, once you, if you know about films and if you know about what it takes to make a film, um, you know, and I've been in a lot of films and I've been in, um, and I've, you know, I've starred in films that had, you know, large budgets. Uh, it's amazing what he did, you know. And, and from that sense, you know, I mean, I, I have to give him all the credit in the world in a 10 out of 10. Yeah. You know, because I do want to get the sequel. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, were there things that could have been done differently? Had we had more time? You know, and I think that's really, you know, if we had, it, when you talk about budget, you know, if we had more time, we had more storage, we had more people on the crew, you know. This movie was actually created, and here's something that I didn't know, which was kind of interesting. I, I heard someone maybe reference Deadpool. Deadpool took three years. You know, it took the same amount of time for them to make that movie with that budget that it took Tommy to make his movie with no budget. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so when you when you really think about what that what he done, or he's done with the movie, what, what we did, you know, the cast and all that, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. So, I, I would I would definitely sign on for a sequel uh, if if it happens. And I uh, had a great time shooting with them, and and, and we're going to be in Michigan for the premiere. Um, you know, so uh, all you I, I think we only have one American on the out of the panel, right? You got Two? EJ and Eugene are both from the states. Oh, okay. So yeah, the twenty fourth. Uh, no, it's the yeah the twenty fourth. In Royal Oak, Michigan, it's the big screen premiere. Obviously, the movie's out, but we're going to get together with the cast and uh, the crew and a bunch of other people in Michigan and have a little party and show it on the big screen. Nice. Yeah, I More than if, welcome. To if, if, I could, if I could get there, I would, but I'm in Brisbane and I'm Australian, so I'm upside down, according to Eugene. <laughs> so. <laughs> we have well, I'm, uh, I'm in California, so Michigan's a bit hard for me to get to, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, had there is this, I an LA party too, by the way. Oh, yeah. is there? Okay, that one, that one I could probably make. Yeah, we're gonna get the. There's, there's a, a sizable LA cast. I mean, Lisa Hansel, obviously. Um, Rico uh, is from LA. Ryan is from LA, and there's Michael Ryan Wong. Husk, it? Yeah, Ryan Husk is from LA, and uh, I actually live in Encinitas, so I'm down by San Diego, and um, you know, I want to meet those guys. I haven't had a chance to meet them yet. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to go to a comic con and cause I know Rico's worked with renegades and, uh, he's, he's really into you know, Star Trek as well as Ryan and Lisa. So, uh, when we have the LA thing, just keep, keep up to date, hit us up on Facebook and, and, uh, we'll let you know where we're getting together. Yeah, that'd be great. Would, would, uh, love to, uh, uh, actually hang out, get to hang out with you guys. Yeah, it'd be fun. No, uh, any, anyway. Um, I'll just one final note before we move on. I just wanted to say 
compared to stuff like Battlestar Galactica, Blood and Chrome, you guys blew them out of the water, and they're an official <laughs> production. So, Thanks. credit where credit's due. You Thank definitely you. deserve Thanks. that sort of that sort of accreditation. I just wanted to get that officially on the record. Um, anyway, moving on to Eugene's model report. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to hit it. So, uh, cool. Have fun. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. You guys take care. Uh, Live have... long, bro. Nice to you, man. You too. Have Later, fun. Bye. bye. Okay, this year's or yeah, this week's model report is more of a hobby report because I got in the February Geek Fuel box. So this is a review of what was in the box. Um, this box had a T-shirt from Deadpool that says uh, "I Heart uh, Ch Chimichanga Chimichangas." Yeah, Chimichangas. <laughs> yeah. It, and it was wrapped in, a, in aluminum foil so it looked like one. Then the other items that were in the box was um, Jane Cobb's uh, stylish uh, winter hat. Uh, it had a one of three, either a Deadpool keychain bottle opener or a pin badge. I got the keychain. There was a little silicone magnet of two magazines and then a download code for a video game. And the video game's a bit of a disappointment because it runs on Windows XP or earlier. Ugh. And there's also, there's also a Mac version and a stream version. Well, that's easy. You just a, uh, open up a uh, um, a virtual uh, a virtual machine. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what that had. And there. Um, then, if you got it with the Star, if you got the Star Wars bonus pack, you got a little bit of a mass. You got a BB-8 eraser. A pillowcase with Apple It's not. You okay, AJ? Mm hmm. Okay, cool. Great, great. I didn't realize you could hear me. Here, I'll, I'll mute it. I was just adjusting in my chair. Sorry to be nervous. It sort of sounded like you fell off. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> and then there's a, uh, a Star Wars comic book, uh, Vader. Vader Down, Issue 1, and it's a limited to one of 15,000 copies. Cool. And that's what was in the box. Nice. Uh-huh. So that's my report for this, this week, and I will be posting pictures, and they've given me a code to post where anybody that uses it will get $5 off any geek fuel box they purchase. Nice. Okay, did you think it was worthwhile? Uh, some of it, yes. Some of the items that I'll, I was a little disappointed in. But for the most part, I'd say yes, it was worth, worth it. Sounds good. Sweet. Yeah, it's definitely okay. something worth sort of hunting down and checking out. Do we have any yep, news? That's Sorry. And that's the model report brought to you by Perry County Hobbies. Uh, <laughs> Eugene is having. It's jumping in and out a little bit, so. Uh, I'm going to blame well, you, Jay. I, I just muted myself so you wouldn't hear the chair. <laughs> so, anyway, Stuart, time to move on to the news. You news. Have, like five minutes. <laughs> All right. So uh, first thing, and this this kind of blew up in a in a day really quickly. Is there's a Star Wars uh, fan film called uh, Darth Maul Apprentice. It's really awesome. Yeah, we'll, we, we'll we, be covering it next week. But I just want to make yeah, a quick we'll mention. Yeah, we'll be covering it next week, definitely. But seriously, go check this out. This is really awesome. Like chore choreography and everything is really really nice. All right. It's Star Wars, therefore it's automatically evil. <laughs> Quiet up, you. Quiet, you. <laughs> Quiet, you. 
Right. Uh, moving along to Deadpool, and Deadpool has cracked the top 50 um, all-time domestic grossing films in America. Well, duh. <laughs> I'm Deadpool. hoping I really would like it to crack top 10. That would be great. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not the million years is going to make number one, but if it did, that would no, be no. <laughs> as much as we, That would be hilarious if it did, but there's a lot of movies to beat. Oh, yeah. It's like, Star Wars just be, uh, made number one. Oh, never mind. Didn't hold that title very long. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Star Wars made number one and, and Deadpool. Gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, if it was Deadpool that overtook it on number one, I would not be sad at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alright, uh, keeping on Star Wars, and uh, Star Wars this week have launched their uh, This Is Madness tournament. Oh, God. So, so uh, what it is, it is a fan vote to decide who the greatest good and evil character is in Star Wars. Who's winning? Uh, it's literally just started. Fair enough. And so fans get to vote, and then, um, f- and then the fans win prizes. <laughs> uh, first place, uh, I- I'll start with fifth place. Fifth place to get um a, a Hasbro BB-8, so like the um like the uh, the Sphero ones. Nice. Uh, a Black Series uh, six-inch figure, and audio um and um Star Wars headphones in the shape of um Boba Fett. Nice. Uh, fourth place gets um all of the above plus a clone trooper uh bus bank so like a money bank. Uh, third place all of the above plus Lego Star Wars Droid Tales DVD. <laughs> That'd make it interesting. Uh, and this is uh, all on StarWars.com slash this dash is dash madness. <laughs> That's right. I've already got it up. I'm looking at it now. Ah. Uh, it looks yeah, like they're uh, doing a tournament similar to what we did. Yeah, it's sort of like you vote up, like you vote yeah. for which one you want to go through and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually really cool because they use all of everything. So they use the movies and the TV shows, so Clone Wars and Rebels and stuff. Yeah. So it'd be really interesting. Yeah, number one is actually the first place gets really cool. First place gets everything, plus a uh, an, a Darth Vader and neon sign from Diamond Select. I'm like, oh, I, w- I would love that. <laughs> so yeah, so it starts on March 14th. 14th, yeah. So oh, it's probably March 15th for us. Yeah, I'm <coughs> God, Garam. I'm trying to bring up a better version of the picture so I can get a better look at it. Uh, I can tell you like the first couple of matchups on uh. both sides. You yep. got um, Obi Wan versus Padme. <laughs> I feel so sorry for Padme. Yeah, way to get knocked out of the first round, guy. This one will be interesting. R two versus Sabine. Ooh, probably R two. Probably R two. Uh, Luke versus Hera from Rebels. Once again, probably Luke. Yeah, Luke. Then you get this probably the hardest one possible. Han, Han versus, versus Chewie. Chewie. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but has Chewie ever done anything to to show that he's more intelligent than Han or resourceful? Well, he hasn't been killed off yet. <laughs> sorry, is that too soon? <laughs> <laughs> is that too soon? I'm sorry. <laughs> I just got <kinda, laughs> to blurt it out and go, oh, that's a bit too soon. I think I'll be getting, going to hell for that one. <laughs> So yeah, you've got Yoda versus Finn. Finn. So Yoda will win. Sorry, Finn. Yeah. Ahsoka versus BB-8. Sorry, Ahsoka. Yeah, sorry, I'm Ahsoka. Going baby. Uh, Rey versus Ezra. That will be also very interesting. Yes, that will. And then Leia versus Poe. Yeah. Mm, probably Leia being knocked out. I'm gonna go Poe. You've got Vader Whoa. versus the fifth brother, which is one of the Inquisitors. So yeah. Vader, obviously. Yeah. And you got the seventh sister versus Jabba. I'm gonna go the seventh sister just because yep. Jabba. Uh, Palpatine versus Ventress. Yeah, probably <laughs> Ventress. What? No. Yeah. What? No. Everyone loves Palpatine. Yeah. That's anyway, what's... we're we're running out of time. So, um, as always, check out Facebook.com/slash/SaveSciFi. The you can find Star Trek Horizons at Facebook.com/slash/STHorizon. Um, check out all of the different places where you can find us in iTunes and other areas all that sort of fun stuff and as always have fun and we will catch you next week when we are talking about the Darth Maul fan film 
I cannot wait to cover that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Truck rules. <laughs> so, uh, Stargate rules. Yep. Agreed. I agree with Amy. <laughs> Stargate wins. Speaking of which, we do no, have top five no, things sci-fi on Facebook page, so make sure you jump onto the Facebook page and vote for which sci-fi you No one sci-fi votes for Stargate. Think. No one votes for Stargate. <laughs> <laughs> Hate you all. Bye. 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 Bye.